Well, good evening. Welcome to our Way Tonight Bob study here at Dynamic Life Graphic Ministry. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, it's good to see your bright and cheery faces. We missed you Sunday. When you weren't here, my sister, we're glad you're here tonight. Thank you. Uh, we thank all the rest of you for being here. And we thank you for listening and tuning in by Facebook Live. And we're continuing our study tonight uh, talking about the idea of the topic or the thought process of how the church can help to be a difference maker in the ethnic uh, turmoil, divide, uh, racial division in our culture and in our country and around the world. So we're looking at different passages that help us to look at uh, the ethnic, racial, partiality, bigotry, prejudice, discrimination, all those kind of words, issues, and what the Bible has to say about those issues. And we'll try to look at that for as long as the Lord will have us to do that. Tonight we want to talk about the royal law of love and discrimination. The royal law of love and discrimination. Discrimination is right if it's authorized by God. Discrimination is right if it's authorized by God. And uh, it's only authorized basically in one context in order to be biblical. And we'll talk about the difference between discrimination when it comes to race, class, culture, ethnic group, uh, background, versus being uh, discriminatory in how we make decisions and how we make judgments and how we view things. So let me start with a word of prayer and then we'll get into our text, which is going to be James chapter 2 tonight. James chapter 2. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity that it is to uh, come here tonight. And we've already spent time in prayer and starting at 6 30 and we pray that you've heard our petitions and our prayers and our thanksgiving and our adoration and our confession of sin we thank you so much for being a father who hears his children who hears his people as we come before the throne of grace and mercy of kindness and long suffering of righteousness and holiness we ask now father that you anoint our minds our hearts and our ears to hear what you have to say to us tonight from your holy word Bless your people, and may we be a blessing unto you as we serve you in this world that you've left us in and placed us in for a time such as this. And we promise to give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's notes for you. Uh, it should be available on the, what we're talking about tonight. Uh, hopefully you get a copy of those notes. If not, they're on the back. First, Simon, could you hand it all out for us? If you don't have them already, thank you so much. As we said already, we're talking about the royal law of love and discrimination. Discrimination is right if authorized by God. And uh, we're going to talk about when there should be discrimination and when there should be discrimination. And uh, this will deal with the subject of partiality. And we'll deal with the subject of biases. And we'll deal with the subject in various forms. If you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 2 if you haven't already, and we want to read uh, verses 1 through 13 of chapter 2 of James. James is a very practical book. It is a book of practical Christianity. It's, it's fairly easy to understand, uh, probably one of the easier books of the New Testament to understand. But James chapter 2, verse 1 to 13 reads as follows. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Another word would be discrimination, but partiality is what's used in some translations. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool, have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But if you have dishonored the poor man, do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you are called? Verse 8. If you really fulfill, and here's the key text for us, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. 
But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So we have here in James a book that helps us to understand practical, everyday situations in everyday Christianity. And related to the subject of what we're dealing with in our culture, all the racial division and all the ethnic division and all the class division, all the political division and all the gender division, we need a word from the Lord to understand how we as Christians are to navigate in this kind of climate that we're dealing with and current times that we're dealing with. So I want to share a number of scriptures that help us to understand what we need to do on this subject. But I've also been teaching a class on Tuesday nights on, uh, at Bible College and Seminary that I teach at, and I'm teaching New Testament survey. And I think one of the major problems for Christians in our modern time is we don't understand the times in which the Bible was written. Mm -hmm. We don't understand what was going on and the types of people who lived at that time. We don't understand about how ethnic issues were seen and how the racists were seen. I'll use the word that people are used to. It's really not a biblical word. Race is not a biblical word. There's only one race, the human race. It just has many different ethnic shades. And I like shades better than colors because there really is no black people. There really is no white people. There are just people who are lighter shades and darker shades and everything in between. And so what does the Bible say about this? And so let me take you back to the first century and talk about two concepts that the Bible used that we're, we're not really familiar with, that we need to be familiar with to understand how we navigate and how we should live in light of the current upheaval that is dealing with all of the ethnic and racial and gender and class issues and political issues that we often divide over in the church. Let me say this, and, and I'll back it up with scripture, there is no place for those kind of identities to cause division among God's people. Being of a different ethnic group should not cause division among God's people. As we saw last couple of weeks in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 through 22 specifically, Christ died not only to save us from our sins, not only to satisfy God's wrath against sin, but he also died to satisfy and solve the enmity between God and man and Jew and Gentile. So there is a vertical aspect of Christ's death, birth, and resurrection, and there's a horizontal aspect. And with his death, birth, and resurrection, he saw both the, the enmity between God and man but he also solved the enmity between Jew and Gentile, who in the first century, back in that culture or the time the Bible was written, those were the two ways you define people groups. You didn't define them by Italian or Asian or black or white. You were either a Jew or you were a Gentile. Those are the two ways people groups in the first century were differentiated or, or the difference was made between them. So I, I don't know your background and your history. I don't think we have any Jewish people in the room. So all of you would be Gentiles. Christ died to save Jews and Gentiles because both Jews and Gentiles need the same salvation because they have the same common problem, sin. Therefore, there is no discrimination, no partiality, no bigotry, no prejudice that should be allowed for those who have been redeemed by the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who are covered in the same blood, who have met at Calvary because they all need the same sacrifice made on their behalf. We have that in common, and that should not be allowed to be divided over earthly issues mm -hmm. and earthly identification. And the reason that this, this, this racial, and I'm using the word that most people are using because that's what you hear on television, 
the reason that why this racial issue goes unsolved in the world is because the photograph or picture that is supposed to show the solution is as messed up as the world is. Mm -hmm. And that's the church. That's believers. That's Christians. The two that he has made one, just like in marriage, he makes the man and the woman one. Ephesians chapter 11 said, chapter 2, verse 11 and following said that he died to make the two, Jew and Gentile, one, just like he now makes God and man one by our faith in Christ Jesus. So we have that commonality, and that commonality bridges all divisions. So whatever class, whatever culture, whatever status you come into the church with, whatever race you come into the church with, whatever political affiliation you come into the church with, whatever gender you come into the church with, and there's only two. <laughs> Sorry. But whatever you come in with, that is not to cause division now that we have commonality in Christ. It's not allowed. James is going to, is going to call it sin. See, we can't solve the racial problem because we don't call it sin. We call it a social issue. We call it a psychological issue. We call it a history issue. No, you got to deal with it with what it is. You got to confess it as sin. And only the gospel of Jesus Christ can solve the sin issue. So if it's a sin issue, then we need to implement and practice the principles of the gospel to solve the sin issue. And James is very clear to say that if you show partiality, if you discriminate between people based on their physical makeup or their position or status of life or lack of position or status in life, you have sin. And sin does not belong as a habitual lifestyle and practice among God's people. Amen. Can I get an amen in there? Yes. So the church is the place where we're supposed to see this unity, this oneness of Jew and Gentile, which is all people groups, male and female. There are only two. We're supposed to see unity, not disunity. Now, when we talk about unity, we're not talking about sameness. God is not calling us to be the same. Right. We're not talking about uniformity where we all dress alike, walk alike, fix our hair the same way, and talk alike. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is the unity that reflects, as we saw in John 17, in Jesus' high priestly prayer, the unity of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the unity that Jesus died to make possible in the church among believers. Amen. We are never going to have unity with the world. They got another dad hmm. who has another kingdom, who has a totally different agenda than our father's agenda. We are going to be at war with them in a certain sense. Now, we are not at war with them just to be fighting. We're at war with them because we're warring for their soul. We're sharing the gospel that brings life. They're rejecting the gospel that brings life. Therefore, there is a war going on. There's a war going on, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and following, verse 11 especially, because there is a demonic realm that is trying to keep them, but there's a heavenly realm that we belong to that's trying to win them to Christ. And so Satan's trying to keep a hold of them. We're trying to rip them out of Satan's hand, and it's a war. Now, Satan wants to cause division because he's the author of confusion and vision. God is not. And if one of the ways he can keep them is by looking and focusing on the racial stuff or the gender stuff or the political stuff, that he keeps them from hearing and responding to the gospel that can save their lives for eternity. Yeah. So we really got to understand what's going on here. You're not going to hear this on the 10 o'clock news. CNN and all them other TV channels don't know what they're talking about are not going to tell you what the real problem is. But welcome to Dynamic Life. We'll give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but truth. <laughs> so help us God. Amen. <laughs> So, 
We need to understand. We need to understand. There is a war. There is a battle going on. This is just one of the schemes that the Satan uses to keep people out of the kingdom of God. It's another scheme he uses to keep the people who claim to be a part of the kingdom divided with one another. And so we need to understand what's really going on with this racial and gender and political stuff. It's more than what you see. And it's more than what you feel. It's a spiritual warfare issue. So I'm going to try to help us to see that tonight. But let me take you back to the first century. You have notes if you're here this evening. And the concept in the Bible is we are to love you are to love your neighbor in light of what you expect to receive. It's, it's the golden rule. Everybody knows the golden rule, right? Do unto others, you would have them do unto you. So don't do anything to somebody else that you wouldn't want them to do to you. That would keep us all out of a whole lot of trouble, wouldn't it? If you want people to respect you, then you need to respect. If you want people to love you, then you need to love. If you want people to be honest with you, you need to be. But very often we want from people what we're not willing to give back. That makes you a hypocrite. That makes you loving you more than you love others. Okay? And so we, you are to love your neighbor in light of what you expect to receive. Listen to this from the first century. There were two words that we're going to use. The familia, which is our word for family. And another word you may not be familiar with, which is kingship, or kinship, I'm sorry, kinship. First ancient preceptions of family and kinship, and these are the two words we want to focus on, were markedly different from modern Western conceptions of family, which tend to be much more individualistic. In other words, we tend to see family as individual people, whereas in the first century they saw the family as a collective, a whole. See, it's a different world. See, the Bible is not written to Americans. I'm sorry to bust your butt. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it's not an American Bible. It's very much an Eastern Bible, written to Eastern folks, but it has Western application. Okay? And so the way they thought about family, we have drifted far away from in our concept of family today. We think of family as, a, as individuals, they thought of family as a collective unit. Families were extended households, entities, normally comprised of a male head. Uh oh. That's a fight in our culture, isn't it? But normally it was, that was in fact there weren't single mothers back then, but it was a family in God's concept is normally has a male head. The man was the leader. I'm sorry, lady. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's I'm sorry. okay, though. It doesn't mean the woman can't achieve whatever she wants with the male head. I mean, it's fine. We'll get there. <laughs> Comprised of a male head, a wife, children, dependents, free men, and slaves. Let me say that one more time because you might have missed it. Normally, a family, the concept of a household, was made of a male head, a wife, that was female, not male. So no Mr. Mom. Children, dependents, mother-in-law, father-in-law, cousins, aunts, nieces could be a part of the family unit. Free men, men who were slaves but had bought their freedom, but chose to be slaves in that household. And slaves household servants, um, people who were bought, purchased, to be slaves. That's a whole nother conversation we don't have time for tonight. The household head, parta familia, or marta familia, male or female, so there were households where the woman was the head of the household because there was no male. Let me say that one more time because y'all missed that. There were households where a woman was the head of the household because there was no male. If there is a male, the male is to be the head of the household. Mm -hmm. Doesn't always work that way. But that's how we so messed up. 
sister said it doesn't work that way anymore. That's why we all messed up in our culture. It, it works that way if you do it God's way. Now, if you don't want to do it God's way, then deal with the fallout of not doing it God's way. And that's what we're doing. We're refusing to do it God's way because we come up with our way. Or we come up with ways because we don't really like God's way because we don't see the family as a collective. We see the individual parts. Amen. So if a man can lead, Oprah will tell you that a woman can lead. Hmm. But Oprah ain't God. Hmm. And Oprah can't even get her man to marry her, so she got problems. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Stephanie. What's the ultimate source of power and identity for the household? And largely determine the social, economic, and religious activities of the family. Catch that now. The head of the household determined, largely determined the social, economic, and religious activities of the family. In other words, whatever the man followed and believed, that's what the whole family followed and believed. Because it's a collective, it's not individual. Y'all ain't praying with me. If the man said this is the, the and, and, and in biblical times, there were a number of little g gods and temples that made up the cities. And in these houses, many of these who were pagan worshipers would have different idols or different entities in their household. But that was chosen by the head of the house. So if he says we're going to worship Zeus, everybody in the house worships Zeus. Uh, this is foreign to us, ain't it? Right, right. Mm -hmm. If he said we're going to worship Aphrodite, everybody worship Aphrodite. If he said we're going to worship Diane, Diana, everybody worship Diana. Whatever deity he chose, that's what the whole household followed. There was no vote. There was no to do to not follow his lead was to be disobedient. Aren't you glad you live in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. Don't be too glad too quick. <laughs> this is a different world. But this is a world that the Bible is based on. Yeah. His or her political allegiances were those of the family. Therefore, if he was a Democrat, the whole family was Democrat. If he was a Republican, everybody was Republican. Because wherever he went, that's what everybody went with. Hello. They didn't have Democrats, but they did have political systems back then, but you get my point. Whatever the head of the household believed, wherever he said we're going to support and vote for and worship, that's what everybody in the household lined up with. Everybody. All right? Are you, are you getting the picture of the first century now? And if, it was a, if a woman was the head of the household and there was no male leader, whatever she said, that's what everybody went with. And remember, the household could be what? Male and a female, or just a female if the husband had passed away or left. But also the slaves, the free men, the children, and, and dependents. You couldn't say, I'm grown, I do what I want. Not in that house. The leader of the household determined what the household voted for, supported, and worshipped. Because they didn't see themselves as individuals, they saw themselves as a collective. His political allegiances were those of the family. His or her religion was that of the family. They developed in the Greco-Roman world particular ethic codes on how to run a household promoting order, honor, piety, and preparation for life in commerce, agricultural, civic, civil leadership, military achievement, and a nurturing family. Families were really families back then. They weren't just attached by blood, they were attached by values and priorities. Did you hear what I said? They weren't just attached by blood, they were attached by values and priorities. Amen. All right. Even when children married into other families, listen to this now. Even when children 
Married into other families, their marriage functioned largely for the benefit of their own family and securing an inheritance of dowry or prestige. In other words, you didn't get married because you had butterflies and stuff. You didn't get married for love, necessarily. That was a benefit that was not purpose. The marriage was always to do what? Benefit the family. That's why they had arranged marriages in the Bible. Right. Old Testament and New Testament. And still in many parts of the world today, people have arranged marriage until they get Americanized. Then they want to date. <laughs> Dating is a Western concept. It's not a biblical concept. And most of the world is following this kind of analogy to family because they are based on an Eastern mindset, not a Western mindset, until our Western mindset invades their country. That's why a lot of countries try to keep us out. Because they see the immorality, they see the wickedness, they see the decay that's going on in our country and they don't want it in there. They don't want, it, they don't want nothing to do with it. <laughs> if a couple divorce, the woman I'm just reading you first century background, okay? If a couple divorce, the woman returned to her father's house until she might be married off again. Sister's saying, uh-uh. <laughs> that's the way it worked back then. And that's the way it works in a lot of the world today. Still, okay? Families were a means of distributing wealth and property to inheritance and intangibles like honor, the family name, and the family cult, which is, has to do with the worship. Family members were expected to show solidarity with one another and to pursue goals that promoted the well-being and reputation of the family as a whole. It was not about the individual person. You were not allowed to do your thing. Live your life. Achieve your dreams. No, it was about the what? Family. What benefited the family? Now, what you need to understand is Jesus applies that to the church. Uh -oh. I just saw everybody go blank. So when Jesus is talking about the church, this is what he has in mind. When he calls the church a family, this is what he has in mind. He does not have 2021 in mind. There's another concept called kinship. That's the familiar family concept, kinship. While kinship could be created by marriage or birth, kinship could also be created by a devotion to a common set of ideals and a shared way of life. In other words, people not related by blood could be like they were related by blood by sharing the same common what? Set of ideas and shared way of life. This type of kinship was fictive, not in the sense of fake or pretend, but in the sense of being cultivated apart from biological or marital bonds. For example, Philio, who is a church historian, praises Gentile converts to the Jewish way of those who left behind their country, their kinfolk, and their families for the sake of virtue and religion by joining a Jewish community and adhering to the Jewish way of life. So there were Gentiles who left their way of life, left their kinfolk, and adhered to the Jewish way of life. That was kinship. Their corresponds with Jesus, this corresponds, I'm sorry, with Jesus' own teaching that his followers would be rewarded for their willingness to leave their own families to follow him. I told you Jesus had the same concept in mind. So you can't be a Christian and not reflect this concept. Did he say that? Yes, I did. <laughs> because this is what it is to be a Christian. This is part of what it is to be a Christian to reflect the familiar, and to reflect the kinship. And you all admitted that you're not Jews, so you're Gentiles, so you came into the family not as a Jew, 
but you agree to adhere to the same set of what? Values and ways of living that are attached to Jesus. Amen. Listen to what Jesus says in his own words. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. No one who has made this choice to come into kinship with me and my family will lose anything they'll only gain. Because when you forsake your blood family to follow Christ and you join Christ's family, which is the church, you get a hundred parents and mothers and brothers and sisters back and you only gave up one or two. See, we know nothing about this in America. We're making choices to follow Christ and giving us nothing. We still hang with the people who don't believe. We, 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 we have more association, affiliation with blood family who don't believe the same thing we believe and don't have the same values we have and relate to Christ more than we do with the people who we say we have Christ in common with. This solves the racial problem. This solves the bigotry problem. This solves the discrimination problem because we all family. Amen. And we all have the same set of values and we all have the same allegiance to the same person, Jesus Christ. Amen. There is no place for partiality or discrimination in this family. But the only problem is that a lot of people who have been adopted in the family just walked in and joined. They, they don't believe in the same set of values. They don't believe in the same core issues. They haven't, they're not willing to forsake everything to follow Christ. He goes on to say, homes, brothers, sisters, these are all things you're forsaking. This is familiar you're giving up to join the kinship of people who come from different families in your blood family. Are, are y'all following this? Amen. Mothers, children, and fields, along with persecution and in the age to come, eternal life. You give all that up. You sacrifice everything to follow Christ. Jesus wants to rebuff the effort of his own family to intervene in his mission. I don't know if you know this passage or not, but Jesus was teaching the disciples and he was, he was teaching them the word. He was discipling them. And his blood family, his mother and his brothers came and tried to get to him and wanted to see him. And someone came in and said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. They want to talk to you. And Jesus asked a question. Who is my mother and my brother? When he get Alzheimer's all of a sudden? Was he being disrespectful? No. He was saying there's a new reality that's being installed. He says, these who obey my father's commandments and word, these are my brothers and sisters. In other words, those who are bonded by a commonality in Christ and, and the heavenly father are more my brothers and sisters and family than those I'm related to by blood. Jesus once rebuffed the efforts of his own family to intervene in his mission, identifying his disciples as his true family, saying, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. That's the standard. That's the new standard. Whoever does God's will is my brother, sister, and mother. In other words, the flip side is what? Whoever doesn't do God's will is not my mother, brother, or sister. Are we getting that this is a totally different reality? But it's not a reality we practice. How do I treat you as my mother, my brother, my sister, now that we have this kinship? 
less than a human being. How do I treat you as three-fifths three of a human being? How do I treat you differently just because you have a different shade than I do? How do I treat you differently just because you have a different status and status in life than I do? I don't. If we have the same allegiance to the same Savior with the same set of values, priorities, and purposes. Do you see how, the, how we're messing this up? Do you see how the church is messing this up? We got the black church over here, and the white church over here, and the Asian church. How, how's the family divided when Christ united the family? We, we, we're all part of the same household. We're all on our same way to the same destination, heaven. We all have eternal life. We all met up at the cross, Calvary. We all been washed in the same blood. We all needed the same Savior because we had the same problem sin, and now we're divided. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. That's not only true for marriage, that's true for the church. That's true for the Jew and Gentile. That's true for God and man. Do you know that nothing can separate us from the love of God, Romans says? That nothing can separate us from God eternally? And do you know if nothing can separate us from God, the same thing that gave us that unity with God is the same thing that gives the Jew and Gentile the same unity? You can very easily say and take Romans and chapter 8 and say, what can separate me from my Jewish or Gentile brother? Because the same commonality we have in Christ is the same basis we have commonality for our Jew and Gentile brothers and sisters. Male and female, black and white, Asian and Hispanic, Democrat, Republican, and Tea Party. None of those things or allow to put asunder what God has united without it being sin to do so. And when we do that, James says you are violating the royal law of love, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. So until we start calling this thing sin, we ain't never solved it. And Washington is not going to call it sin. And the race baiters are not going to call, call it sin because that's how they make their money and that's how they keep their fame. But the church. Oh, we're supposed to have a different answer and a different reflection. Paul conceived of his churches as a family, God's family, in which uh, kinship superseded other allegiances. Paul saw the church as a family, and that relationship, that kinship, superseded all other allegiances. I don't have any right to the fact that you're a Democrat and somebody else is a Republican. I don't have a right to divide with you over that. And not talk to you and hate you and treat you and slander you and be bitter against you. That's not allowed to divide family. I don't have a right to, 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 to be divided with you because there's a part of our history we don't like in America because we treated certain people in a way we shouldn't have treated as wrong as that was, as sinful as that was. But I don't have a right once you come to Christ to be divided with you over that. And I don't have a right to continue to try to use my white privilege to be divided from you if we're both in Christ. Are y'all following me on that? That's sin all day long. S I N and big capital bold print letters. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. That's from Ephesians chapter 2. The family metaphor for the church requires both solidarity and demonstrable affection among believers, as Paul instructed the Thessalonians. 
You do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia, Paul told them. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Oh, you're loving people, but you can do better. Love them more. And when you love them more, guess what you do? Love them some more. And when you love them more and more, guess what you do? You love them some more. That means I don't drag up your past stuff if you've been forgiven by Christ. I wish somebody was praying with me. How am I going to hold a sin against you that Christ forgave me for? You do want to do unto others as God has done to you, right? Yes. And he's forgiving you of your sin, then why are you dragging up? Oh, I'm not dragging up yours. I'm dragging up your forefathers. But then go dig them up in the grave and talk to them. Don't talk to me because I'm not racist. <laughs> we are just silly about this stuff. Let me talk to my Caucasian brothers and sisters. I love y'all. We love you too. <laughs> you do not have to apologize to me. I'm talking to me. Maybe some of y'all out there feel like they need to apologize to you. I'm talking about me. So don't send me no emails and don't text me. <laughs> you do not have to apologize to me for sins that were committed by your great, 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 and put on more grace till you get there in the 1600s and 1700s than it did against my great, 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 great people. If you have been washed in the blood, if you have confessed your sins, if God has forgiven you, I forgive you too. Amen. Because when I go to the throne and I need forgiveness of God, I don't want him saying, you ain't forgiven them. <laughs> didn't I tell you to do unto others you have them do unto you? Don't, didn't I tell you that you are to forgive as you have been forgiven by me? Then what are you doing here asking me to forgive your sins and you holding theirs against them? You hypocrite. Get out of my sight. Because that's hypocrisy. That's sin. To want God to forgive you and you won't forgive others is hypocrisy. Don't tell me about the history. Don't tell me about your mom and daddy. Don't tell me about the time you were pulled over by the policeman. All of that is wrong, 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 wrong. That has nothing to do with the fact that you need to forgive as you've been forgiven by God. Now, y'all know that I get me kicked out of most places, right? <laughs> yeah. There are some places I could not go and say what I'm saying tonight. And go back. <laughs> but this is the same thing I would say if I was in a totally black church, if I was in a totally white church, if I was in a totally Hispanic church, totally Asian church, because it's the word of God. Mm -hmm. And my job and your job is to say what God would say on these issues. Not what your race or your culture or your peeps would say. Because we're God's ambassadors. Ambassadors of reconciliation. We're looking for reconciliation. Now, I heard a message recently by Tony Evans, and I think it would be good to talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is a decision, not an emotion. Just like you must choose to love, you must choose to forgive. It's not an emotion. Well, I don't feel like what well, it ain't got nothing to do with you feel. You choose to forgive. You make a choice. But that doesn't necessarily mean you forget the hurt that came with the wrong. You're just choosing not to hold that wrong against them any longer as you deal with the hurt. You got hurt? Yes. You may never forget. But you can choose by an act of your will not to hold that against them. Not to treat them differently and not to treat them with an unloving attitude in spite of the memories and hurt you still remember. 
Because that's what God did for you. And that's what you daily when you sin against him. He makes a choice to love you and to forgive you. It's a decision. It's not an emotion. There are two aspects of forgiveness. One is unilateral forgiveness, and there is one is transactional forgiveness. Unilateral forgiveness is basically the idea of, uh, that you choose, you make a decision to forgive whether the person responds or does not respond, whether the person repents or does not repent, whether the person says they're sorry or doesn't say it. You can choose to offer forgiveness. Jesus did this with Judas, right? Judas didn't come and say he was sorry, but Jesus offered him the suck. He offered him the opportunity of forgiveness. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, he looked down, he looked up and said, Father, forgive them, therefore they know not what they do. They didn't repent, they didn't confess anything, but he made what? A decision to forgive or offer forgiveness whether they responded or not. Now I hear what some of you are saying because I've been preaching and teaching long enough to know what people be thinking in their mind. That's Jesus, I'm not Jesus. Well then turn over to Acts chapter 6 and Stephen did the same thing that Jesus did. When the people picked up stones to stone him, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he was human like all of us. No divinity to speak of. But if you read that text in Acts chapter 7, when he looked up, he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. See, when you look and see Jesus, you don't see people. Y'all get that when y'all leave here tonight. <laughs> the reason why you're still harboring unforgiveness is because you're looking at people, you ain't looking at Jesus. <laughs> Evidently, the early church was comprised of people with an ethically mixed and socially diverse kinship devoted to Jesus and united by a common concern to love and support one another as a single family. So I said there's unilateral forgiveness, but there's transactional. Transactional means that the person confesses, they repent, and you offer them forgiveness. A transaction has occurred. They offer what? Confession of their sin. They've asked for forgiveness of their sin. They've, they're demonstrating acts of repentance for their sin, and now you make a decision to offer them forgiveness. One is little and out. You can do it whether they respond or they apologize or not. Or you can do transaction where they, they come and they ask for forgiveness and they give signs of repentance and you forgive. And that's when reconciliation can take place. Reconciliation can't take place with unilateral forgiveness. Reconciliation, that which is broken, being mended, can only take place when there's transactional forgiveness. Y'all with me? And so we are to be a forgiving people because we are a forgiven people. We are to be a forgiving people because we are a forgiven people. And Genesis chapter 50, the story of Joseph, which is I tell you, I, I would encourage you to read the life of Joseph because if anybody shall have a grudge, it should have been Joseph. Because his brother sold him into slavery and then he went through all kinds of stuff. But when his brothers come to him, they don't even recognize him. But he recognizes them. And there is no animosity in Joseph's heart. Now Joseph didn't forget what they had done to him because he says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. He obviously remembered what they had done. But he chose to forgive them even while still remembering the wrong that was done to him. So the church is to be a model of that because they are a model of forgiveness. But we have a familiar aspect, family, and we have a kinship aspect. And we don't understand background, so we don't understand how this thing is really supposed to work. You are my brothers and sisters because we have the same common faith in Jesus Christ and now we have the same common core values and we have the same common purpose. 
even though we're from different families, from different ethnic groups, from different political sides, from different genders, there's only two. But that kinship gives us what? Commonality. And we're, we're family now. And that's why we call each other brothers and sisters. Because we're family. No matter what your shade is, we're family. No matter whether you came from the up house or the white house or the poor house or no house, we're family. And I treat you with no discrimination and no partiality. Or I'm sinning if I don't. So there's a lot of repentance that needs to happen in churches. Because we're violating the royal law. And I know that you guys are just chomping at the bit. Get to the royal law. That's for next week. But I want to lay a foundation of familiar and kinship that is so important because it's what Jesus had in mind in Luke 14 when he told us what we must forsake to follow him. And we must forsake everything that is not in line with him to follow him. Or he says three times in Luke 14, you cannot be my disciples. You cannot be learners and followers of me. You cannot be Christian. You cannot be a believer. And if Jesus said three times cannot, he mean cannot. So we got to work on these issues. Each of us individually and corporately. Because we're not just individuals, we're individuals who make up a collective family with a common kinship that is based on Christ. Amen? Amen? Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you so much for this time. We pray that you will take these words and drive them home to the hearts and ears and minds and souls of those who have heard what they have heard tonight, that they will go and read James chapter 2, verse 1 to 13 for themselves, and they will do the background study on the concept of familiar and kinship to see that these things are true, and that they will read Luke 14, where Jesus talks about family and kinship concepts, things we didn't even know, but he didn't have to explain to that audience because they understood exactly what he was talking about. Father, we pray for the church in America especially, but we pray for the church all around the world, where we've allowed fleshly divisions, fleshly values, earthly concepts to divide that which you died, were buried and rose again in the sin to make one. That which you sent the Holy Spirit to maintain the unity and the bond of peace. Forgive us, Father, for historically and even presently violating and marring the picture that you have designed. Glorify yourself by those that who will hear this and be changed. Who will confess and repent of the evil in their heart that they have been showing partiality and discrimination and bigotry and hatred and bitterness and envy and jealousy. Cleanse our hearts this evening. Wash us and make us white as snow. Purify us so that our worship and our service will not be in vain. As you do this, we promise to give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' wonderful name, let every heart say, Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for coming. We'll pick up on that thought.